When you think about businesses that are selling through the roof, like Allo or Allbirds, sure, you think about a great product, a cool brand, and great marketing. But an often overlooked secret is actually the businesses behind the business, making selling, and for shoppers, buying, simple. For millions of businesses, that business is Shopify. Nobody does online business better than Shopify. It's home of ShopPay, the number one checkout in the world. You can use it to boost conversions up to 50%, meaning way less carts going abandoned and way more sales going through to checkout. Sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash income, all lowercase. Go to shopify.com slash income to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash income. The Presidencies of the United States is a proud member of the Evergreen Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Presidencies of the United States. I'm your host, Jerry Landry. So I actually have a special treat for all of you. If you've listened to the latest episode of Presidencies, then you'll already know Peter Zablocki, who is the host of the History Shorts podcast. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that episode yet, I do hope you'll check it out. We had a great discussion on what the post-presidency looked like for the first five presidents, so the, the presidents in the early republic. We had a great discussion about that, so hope you'll check that out if you haven't already. But for those of you who have and you want to know a bit more about Peter and his work on the History Shorts podcast, you're in luck. I actually have an episode of his that we're doing a feed swap, so you'll get to hear an episode of History Shorts here on the Presidency's podcast, and then you can add History Shorts wherever you get your podcast, add it to your regular rotation. I know it's on mine. But just to share a little more about Peter, Peter is an award-winning author, historian, and college professor, and his podcast, the History Shorts Podcast, consists of daily short episodes about often stupefying history and weekly interviews with historians and history personalities. Whether it's Pulitzer Prize-winning historians, the new National World War I memorial sculptor, or the National Archivist of the United States, the conversations and topics are always lighthearted and easily accessible. But this month, his spotlight guest is Mr. Dan Carlin of the Hardcore History Podcast. You may have heard of this guy before if you know anything about history podcasts. Peter and Dan discuss the inspiration behind their appreciation for the study of history, how the discipline has evolved over the years, and how podcasts present a unique approach to storytelling. So I hope you enjoy this episode, and please, like I said, check out History Shorts Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Evergreen Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcast. Thanks so much. I'm Ken Harbaugh, host of Burn the Boats from Evergreen Podcasts. I interview political leaders and influencers, folks like award-winning journalist Soledad O'Brien and conservative columnist Bill Kristol about the choices they confront when failure is not an option. I won't agree with everyone I talk to but I respect anyone who believes in something enough to risk everything for it. Because history belongs to those willing to burn the boats. Episodes are out every other week wherever you get your podcasts. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Thank you so much for making History Shorts part of your daily routine. And if you have not already done so, make sure you click that subscribe button. If you have a comment, you can find me at www.historyshortspodcast.com. If you like the show and want to support it, the best thing you can do is tell a friend. You could also spread the word on social media, leave a review, or buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash history shorts podcast. Have a great rest of your day. Historian Dan Carlin of the Hardcore History Podcast is a podcast legend known for his distinctive approach to storytelling and historical narrative. And might I add, an absolute inspiration of mine. Mr. Carlin, I humbly welcome you to the History Shorts Podcast. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm going to correct you, though, and just point out that I am not a historian, 
because I'm a big fan of historians uh, and I wouldn't lump myself in with people doing the original research. But if I'm adding any people to their reading lists or to their classes, I'll consider that a personal victory. So thank you. So what initially sparked your interest in history to become a fan of history and how and why did you decide to turn that into a career? Uh, I don't know what sparked the interest because it predates any sort of conscious memory on my part. And and I don't know if that if if there's other people that can relate to this, but I feel like different people ha are, are geared differently, right? Or, or constri I have a friend whose entire world is a math problem. I mean, he sees the entire world in numbers and that's and he can't understand how anybody else would make sense of reality because, you know, that's how his brain is sort of imprinted. And I feel like I'm in the group of people where uh, history and linear time is sort of how I organize reality. That's my framework. And so my interest in the past sort of predates any being old enough to self-analyze it at all. So I was born this way, I guess, is the short answer. And turning it into a career, well, that's a different story. When I was a history major in college, they used to, at the history department green room, they used to have a pamphlet that said what to tell your parents about choosing history as a major to try to give you some arguments because you know a lot of parents would be like how are you going to make a living with that but what wasn't really understood until I got out into the job world is how many people took history in college and then realized how it helped them in a whole bunch of other careers that on the surface you don't think of as history related so I went into uh, news and reporting and the number of reporters, and generally the most serious reporters, the ones that they would give the really hard stories that went on for months and months or that had huge backstories with a lot of context, a lot of those guys were history majors, I found out. And it was that old line that journalism is the first draft of history. So why wouldn't it make sense to have somebody with training in history and recording of current events when they become not so current events? Uh, why wouldn't it make sense for those people to find their way to things like the reporting of current events and the filling in of context and background for the audience, right? I mean, that's essentially, it's, it's history on the really, really short term, you know, timeline. But so I didn't realize that I was making a living in history when I got into news, but I started to realize that a lot of other people doing news had a similar background to what I had. And then I moved into uh, current events talk radio and my, what I brought to the table, everybody told me anyway, was a, a focus on history, a focus on the past, putting current events into context. So giving the history of how we got from, from A to Z, right? And we were at Z when we were talking about some current event. And then while I was doing early podcasting, which was current events also like my old radio show, my mother-in-law had thrown an idea out to me once that I never would have gotten myself, which is... I was telling a gore, you know, this has become a famous trope now of mine, but but I was telling the story at dinner, some gory, probably shouldn't have been telling that story at dinner, history story. And I've always assumed it was to change the subject. And my mother-in-law said, well, why don't you do a podcast about this sort of stuff? And I said, because I'm not qualified. I'm not a historian. I don't have a doctorate. And she said, I didn't know you had to have a doctorate to tell stories. And that's when the light bulb went on over my head. And I realized how many of the history books in my library were written by writers without, you know, history credentials. And, and you start to realize, OK, you can do this, but you have to do it a certain way. You have to do a show about history that is consciously put together by a non-historian. And so you do it differently. And we so we started off with an idea. And then over time, that idea evolved into what we have now as we figured out with a lot of audience feedback, how one does this. And so I think that's the answer to both those questions. Looking across the vast expanse of history that you have covered, what are some recurring themes or lessons? Well, some of them sound like those old themes that we used to have in English class, and they used to have names for them, like man's inhumanity to man, right? Themes like that. To me, that's and, you know, look, I, I, I have friends who are history nuts like I am, and they tend to be more optimistic sometimes. I'm not generally one of those people. And the one thing that you can see that doesn't change is man's inhumanity to man. So if we talk about elements in our, um, you know, I think about like the old Star Trek episodes where they would try to explain humans or aliens would try to explain humans. And they would say, you know, you're a violent species or you're this or you're that. 
And, and truthfully, that to me is the recurring nightmare of human history is that we can change a lot of things about who we are. I mean, some people even say that we're partially cyborgs at this point, carrying around these computers in our pockets that we have. But the one thing it hasn't changed with all these things that are so different than the world I grew up in, right, the analog world, is we're still as horrible to each other as we've always been. So the funny thing is when one talks about consistency in human affairs, what's sad is that man's inhumanity to man is one of those things you can point your finger on and say, we're getting no better at that at all, as far as I can tell. Do you think history is more cyclical or linear in a sense? You know, I think a lot about this because, you know, you're going to know this better than I am, that, that there's always been these, these uh, attempts to find what they would call in physics a grand unifying theory, right, of history and some way that you can then apply it towards uh, actual problem solving, right? The George Santayana line, if you, if those who are, you know, doomed uh, to repeat history if they don't remember it. But that implies that if you remember it, you'll do something differently. And I'm not sure that that's the case because, you know, history is full of variables, right? I mean, you know, um, there's, there's a phrase that I used to attribute to Mark Twain before I realized how stupid it is to attribute a historical quote to anybody, because apparently nobody said anything they've ever been uh, uh, supposed to have said. But, but I used to think Twain said this. Now I don't care who says it. I love it regardless. And it's this line that, that history doesn't repeat, but it sometimes rhymes. And I've been thinking about why it might rhyme. And it seems to me it rhymes because we're the factor that doesn't change, right? It's that Shakespearean line that all the world's a stage and all the people merely players. And the reason it seems cyclical is because the players are persons, right? We're human. And I used to have a friend who was into sales and he, he used to like regale me with, I forgot how many there were, seven or eight special hot buttons that human beings have. And he said, nobody has all of them, but every person has some of them. And they were things like greed, heartstrings, family. You know, they were all these things that if the, if the salesperson couldn't get you with one of them, they moved on to the next one. And eventually one of those buttons worked on everybody. Well, one of those buttons always worked on anybody, right? He could go back in time and the heartstrings or the greed or the sentimentality or whatever he's trying to sell somebody by pushing a button, those buttons are still in play even in Shakespeare's time. So the parts of the story that seem cyclical, I think, I'm, I'm guessing, or recurring are these parts that just don't change about us, right? We're the key element in the story that remains the same. Um, and I think like if you put human beings who remain basically the same into systems that seem similar, you end up with what appear to be cyclical commonality. So for example, uh, the Roman Republic, you take these human beings with their special hot button issues, greed, sentimentality, heartstrings, whatever, and you put them in a system like a republic that looks like our own, where we have elections, corruption, senators, uh, ven venality, all those sorts of things, right? Pandering to the electorate. And it begins to look a lot like what we have now, because you add a political system that's similar with human beings who are similar. So I think it's, it's less cyclical than it is we run into the same things because human beings are still motivated by the same things. And those things are sort of hardwired into the bones of our societies. So the, so the, the edifice, the skin can change, the vascular system can change, the cyborg part of it can change, but at the core, you know, we're still the Romans, right? We're still the people. And so I think that's sort of what makes it all look the same is that the people in the story are the same. Absolutely. I just remember reading somewhere literally this morning how the guy that discovered King Tut's tomb, when they opened the actual tomb and they opened the casket and everything, and the one humanizing factor of it all was that on top of him were like withered flowers. Oh, you know, so Howard, Howard Carter, right? Wasn't Howard yep. Carter? The that was, yeah. yep, yep, yep. Yeah. And uh, I, to me, I love that story because that that's our wish of all of us to be Indiana Jones, right? And to not spend our archaeological time I mean, I remember thinking I wanted to become an archaeologist. Then I thought of all the years I would spend with a paintbrush, just brushing the tiniest bit of dirt off. You know, I used to say that I wanted to be an American archaeologist. And when somebody said, what's an American archaeologist? I said, an impatient archaeologist. So the kind of people you call when you're going to build an Aswan dam or something, and you're going to flood the entire valley in six months, and you say to them, 
get whatever you can get out fast. Otherwise, it's getting flooded. And you go in there with bulldozers. Forget the, the little paintbrushes. You say, hey, normally I'd have a paintbrush, but otherwise it's all getting flooded. And I'm going to grab every mummy I see. You know, I'm going to excavate. <laughs> so just be the impatient archaeologist. Yeah, this belongs in a museum. Kind that's of, right. Know. That's right. If I break a few things on the way, I'm still saving it from the flood, right? Oh, I love it. Do you encounter any historical misconceptions that are common or pop up often when you conduct your research? Well, yeah, but it's my own fault because I love to use some of the older histories as a way to contrast the newer ones. So I would never rely on the older histories because they're older and there's a lot of stuff known now. And because a lot of them are from times where, you know, you'll read them and you'll just go, oh, boy, we don't think like this anymore. Thank goodness. But sometimes they deal with things that sort of um, juxtapose interestingly with the modern ones. Yet reading them, you can clearly see, oh, in this era, they were firmly into the belief of social Darwinism or they were in. And you can see how it it. Well, we talked earlier about the the bones, maybe of, of a certain way of thinking. You can see how it infects everything they do and, and not not to jump on you know something you hear so much about in society anyway. But the racism is a perfect example. So many good histories were written uh, from the period like 1900 to 1920. But it is absolutely impossible to get away from the current attitudes at the time, right, about savages versus, you know, and and so it, it infects everything they do. It doesn't make their histories useless, but in a funny way, it almost becomes something modern historians would study today, right, studying the historiography of the past historians, right? Um, so I, I encounter it all the time, but I kind of seek it out because there's value in, you know, what was the old line my English teacher always used, comparing and contrasting the way we used to do history versus now and how it kind of shows you your own societies and your own time periods blind spots, you know? I remember my son was reading Edgar Rice Burroughs. Uh, it was either John Carter or Tarzan. Uh, oh, Tarzan. Yeah, one of the. And there was, you know, there's definitely language that we would not use today. And he's like, Dad, OK, so I have to explain. Like, this was written in 1912. So you know, it's it's trying to explain that to him, just putting things in context. Well, I actually uh, in, in a show I just did, I quoted the George Santana line I mentioned earlier, right, about those who do not remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And I, I quoted it because. I wanted to give the whole quote because that quote's actually taken out of context and used incorrectly. So I gave the whole quote, but the whole quote includes some of those things we just talked about, right? He refers to certain people as savages. Um, well, it was written in 1905, right? He was trying to make a point and he wasn't trying to slam anybody, but the preconceptions and the prejudices of his day infected his ability to sort of assess things, we would say today, from a not a neutral standpoint, because we're making the same mistakes today that he made. We just don't know it, right? They're going to tell us in a hundred years when they have to write a disclaimer about the histories we're doing, right? Well, you have to remember that was 2023 and things were different back then. So, I mean, I feel like this is part of the, the wheel going round and you get to do your histories as up-to-date as they are in the era you are, and then you get to watch them get outmoded and outdated, just like all the earlier histories were. So you've been podcasting for a while. I guess my last question, how has the landscape, podcasting landscape evolved and what role do you think the medium can play in the field of history? Oh, that's a, listen, that's a four hour podcast right there <laughs> I mean, because, because there's no way to describe to people now how different it was in 2005. Uh, the one thing I can say is we started the very month, I believe it was July 2005, when Apple started supporting podcasts. Um and if you looked at the various podcasts that were up then, it looked like mostly people in their dorm rooms. Uh, you know, I mean, it was it, it, there's no way to describe it today compared to the professional um, commercial corporate environment that you see now. Um, and, and truthfully, I don't I, I can't even try to put myself in the shoes of somebody who decides today to start a podcast in the current environment. It's just such a different environment. It's interesting to note, though, that audio and, and the podcast is video now, too. So this is a weird statement to say, but I'm an audio guy. And to see audio make a comeback like this is so interesting because there was always this idea once TV came around and especially when video on computers came around, 
that audio is an old medium, right? A restricted medium, an inferior medium. Why would you ever do audio if you could do video? And I think what it's proven once again is two things. One, it's amazingly able to conform to your life. So it doesn't take your full attention. If you need to mow the lawn or iron the clothes or whatever, you can listen to audio and have your attention. You can do it while driving, right? You wouldn't want to watch a video podcast while driving. So I think that's one of the things that I think makes a huge difference. The other is something you and I talked about before the show officially started, which is this idea of how your mind fills in the pictures for you, right? The theater of the mind. I have such a hard time myself watching dramatic movies made about historical events because my mind has a different view of what those things should look like than what they look like on the screen. But if you give me an audio, a storytelling version of it, or a book, to be honest, then my brain fills it in the way my brain thinks is correct. And that works for me. So I'm one of those people that can truthfully say that I understand when when people when I was growing up who were raised on radio would tell me that something was lost when television came around. And the something that was lost was your ability to interpret what you were hearing completely through your own lens. And five people could be sitting around that radio in the 1930s living room hearing the same story and yet having a very different mental conception of the pictures of what was going on. And I feel like the podcasting, especially the early years when it got really popular initially, but there was really no video podcast, was the ability for, for pure audio and, and the, ancient, the ancient craft of storytelling to rise up and say, hey, we're not dead yet. There's a reason that this has been around as long as it has, and, um, and we're going to prove to you that there's still a market for this, and I think it has. That's funny. I actually still listen to old time radio. I have the same spades and the Johnny Dollars and all the mystery shows. That's that's like my go to. It's almost a lost art. I remember when we started the podcast, not the con- not the current events one I did because that was uh, they used to call it meatball surgery and mash when they did so. Sur- it was meat meatball current events podcasting in the sense that you know you had your articles that you would circle in the paper and you would talk a little. The, but when we started doing the history show, that was really the first thing I ever designed just for this podcasting medium with all the freedom that that allowed. And so I bought some books on old time radio and the theater of the mind stuff and how they how they worked to conjure up sort of the images in your head. And I thought, you know, there's going to be a lot of listeners who think that this is a completely new way of doing things, when in reality, it's the age old recycling of great ideas from the past that new generations just haven't been exposed to yet. And so we literally went and mined that material, figuring there's been a lot of creative work done by a lot of really fantastically gifted people to make audio come to life. Uh, We're going to go in and revitalize some of those ideas and reuse them again. Mr. Carlin, thank you so much for speaking with me today. Happy to do it. I wish you all the luck in the world, and I'm glad you're doing this too. Congratulations. I hope you guys enjoy my conversation with Mr. Dan Carlin, and I hope you come back tomorrow for another episode of History Shorts Podcast. And don't forget to tune in next Friday as we have a conversation with Mr. Patrick O'Donnell, the United States' foremost authority on special forces and a New York Times bestselling author. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. ever wondered why we call french fries french fries or why something is the greatest thing since sliced bread there are answers to those questions everything everywhere daily is a podcast for curious people who want to learn more about the world around them every day you'll learn something new about things you never knew you didn't know subjects include history science geography mathematics and culture if you're a curious person and want to learn more about the world you live in just subscribe to everything everywhere daily wherever you cast your pod